I read poetry all the time and write about it frequently and take poems apart to see how they work because I'm a word person. I understand the world best, most fully in words rather than, say, pictures or numbers. And when I have a new experience or a new feeling, I'm a little frustrated until I can try to put it into words. I think I've always been that way. I devoured science fiction as a child. I still do. And I found poems by Andrew Marvel and Matthew Arnold and Emily Dickinson and William Butler Yeats because they were quoted in science fiction and I loved their sounds. And I went on to read about a t a v a r i m a and medial caesuras and enjambment and all that other technical stuff that you care about if you already care about poems because poems already made me happier and sadder and more alive and I became a poetry critic because I wanted to know how and why. Now, poetry isn't one thing that serves one purpose any more than music or Computer programming serve one purpose. The Greek word poem just means a made thing, and poetry is a set of techniques, ways of making patterns that put emotions into words. The more techniques you know, the more things you can make, and the more patterns you can recognize in things you might already like or love. That said, poetry does seem to be especially good at certain things. For example, we're all going to die. <laughs> Poetry can help us live with that. Poems are made of words, nothing but words. The particulars in poems are like the particularities, the personalities that distinguish people from one another. Poems are easy to share, easy to pass on, and when you read a poem, you can imagine someone's speaking to you or for you. Maybe even someone far away, or someone made up, or someone deceased. That's why we can go to poems when we want to remember something or someone to celebrate, or to look beyond death, or to say goodbye. And that's one reason poems can seem important, even to people who aren't me, who, who don't so much live in a world of words. The poet Frank O'Hara said, if you don't need poetry, bully for you. But he also said when he didn't want to be alive anymore, the thought that he wouldn't write any more poems had stopped him. Poetry helps me want to be alive, and I want to show you why by showing you how. How a couple of poems react to the fact that we're alive in one place, at one time, in one culture, and in another we won't be alive at all. So, Here's one of the first poems I memorized. It could address a child or an adult. From far, from eve and morning, from yon twelve-winded sky, the stuff of life to knit me blew hither, here am I. Now, for a breath I tarry, nor yet disperse apart, take my hand quick and tell me, what have you in your heart? Speak now and I will answer. How shall I help you? Say, ere to the wind's twelve quarters I take my endless way. Now, this poem has appealed to science fiction writers. It's furnished at least three science fiction titles. I think because it says poems can bring us news from the future or the past or across the world. Because their patterns can seem to tell you what's in somebody's heart. It says poems can bring people together temporarily, which I think is true, and it sticks in my head not just because it rhymes, but for how it rhymes, cleanly and simply on the two and four, say and way, with anticipatory hints on the one and three, answer and quarters, as if the poem itself were coming together. It plays up the fact that we die by exaggerating the speed of our lives, a few years on earth become one speech, one breath. It's a poem about loneliness. The I in the poem feels no connection will last, and it might look like a plea for help till you get to the word help, where this I facing you, taking your hand, is more like a teacher or a genie, or at least that's what he wants to believe. It would not be the first time a poet had written the poem that he wanted to hear. Now, 
This next poem really changed what I liked and what I read and what I felt I could read as an adult. It might not make any sense to you if you haven't seen it before. The Garden. Oleander. Coral from lipstick ads in the 50s. Fruit of the tree of such knowledge. To smack thin air, meaning kiss or hit. It appears in the guise of outworn usages because we are bad. Big masculine threat, insinuating and slangy. Now, I found this poem in an anthology of almost equally confusing poems in 1989. I just heard that there were these scandalous writers called language poets who didn't make any sense, and I wanted to go and see for myself what they were like, and some of them didn't do much for me, but this writer, Ray Armentrout, did an awful lot, and I kept reading her till I felt I knew what was going on, as I do with this poem. It's about the Garden of Eden and the fall and the biblical story of the fall, in which sex as we know it and death and guilt come into the world at the same time. It's also about how appearances deceive, how our culture can sweep us along into doing and saying things we didn't intend or don't like, and Armentrout's style is trying to help us stop or slow down. Smack can mean kiss, as in air kisses, as in lip smacking, but that can lead to smack as in hit, as in domestic abuse because sexual attraction can seem threatening. The red that means fertility can also mean poison. Oleander is poisonous. And outworn usages like smack for kiss or hit can help us see how our unacknowledged assumptions can make us believe we are bad, either because sex is sinful or because we tolerate so much sexism, we let guys tell women what to do. The poem reacts to old lipstick ads, and its edginess about statement, its reversals and halts, have everything to do with resisting the language of ads that want to tell us so easily what to want, what to do, what to think. That resistance is a lot of the point of the poem, which shows me, Armin Trout shows me what it's like to hear grave threats and mortal dishonesty in the language of everyday life. And once she's done that, I think she can show other people, women and men, what it's like to feel that way and say to other people, women and men, who feel so alienated or so threatened that they're not alone. Now, how do I know that I'm right about this somewhat confusing poem? Well, in this case, I emailed the poet a draft of my talk, and she said, yeah, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> yeah. But usually, you can't know. You, you never know. You, you can't be sure. And that's okay. All we can do is listen to poems and, and look at poems and guess and see if they can bring us what we need. And uh, if you're wrong about some part of a poem, nothing bad will happen. <laughs> Now, this next poem is older than Armand Trout's, but uh, a little younger than A.E. Houseman's. The Brave Man. The sun, that brave man, comes through boughs that lie in wait, that brave man. Green and gloomy eyes and dark forms of the grass run away. The good stars, pale helms and spiky spurs run away. Fears of my bed, fears of life and fears of death run away. That brave man comes up from below and walks without meditation, that brave man. Now the sun in this poem in Wallace Stevens' poem, seems so brave because the person in the poem is so afraid. The sun comes up in the morning through branches, dispels the dew, the eyes on the grass, and defeats stars envisioned as armies. Brave has its old sense of showy as well as its modern sense, courage. This sun is not afraid to show his face. But the person in the poem is afraid. He might have been up all night. That is the reveal Stephen saves for that fourth stanza where run away has become a refrain. This person might want to run away too, but fortified by the sun's example, he might just rise. Stevens saves that sonically odd word meditation for the end. Unlike the sun, human beings think. We meditate on past and future, life and death, above and below, and it can make us afraid. 
poems, the patterns in poems show us not just what somebody thought or what someone did or what happened, but what it was like to be a person like that, to be so anxious, so lonely, so inquisitive, so goofy, so preposterous, so brave. That's why poems can seem at once so durable, so personal, and so ephemeral, like something inside and outside you at once. The Scottish poet Denise Riley compares poetry to a needle, a sliver of outside I cradle inside. And the American poet Terence Hayes wrote six poems called Wind in a Box. One of them asks, tell me, what am I going to do when I'm dead? And, and the answer is that he'll stay with us or won't stay with us inside us as wind, as air, as words. It is easier than ever to find poems that might stay inside you, that might stay with you from long, long ago or from right this minute, from far away or from right close to where you live, almost no matter where you live. Poems can help you say, help you show how you're feeling, but they can also introduce you to feelings, ways of being in the world, people very much unlike you, maybe even people from long, long ago. Some poems even tell you that that is what they can do. That's what John Keats is doing in his most mysterious, perhaps, poem. It's mysterious because it's probably unfinished. He probably left it unfinished. And because it might be meant for a character in a play, but it might just be Keats's thinking about what his own writing, his handwriting, could do. And in it, I hear, at least I hear, mortality, and I hear the power of older poetic techniques. And I have the feeling, you might have the feeling of meeting, even for an instant almost, becoming someone else from long ago, someone quite memorable. This living hand, now warm and capable of earnest grasping, would, if it were cold and in the icy silence of the tomb, so haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights that thou wouldst wish thine own heart dry of blood, so in my veins red life might stream again and thou be conscience calmed. See, here it is. I hold it toward you. Thanks.